Hi beautiful souls, this is Sarina. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to have a look at the Wild Unknown Animal Spirit Oracle. As well, of course, we'll look at Kim Kranz's tarot deck, the Wild Unknown Tarot. And I have pulled a few cards from the Ostera Tarot, the Crow Tarot, the Messenger Oracle, as well as the Naked Heart Tarot. And I thought we could look at some of the symbology and the crossover between some of these decks um, as far as the symbology goes and the choice of animals. This has been a really beneficial process for me and I hope that in sharing some of the details, some of my insights, it will help to, in, uh, help to increase the ease and the fluency that you read these decks with. So let's get started. We're looking at the Wild Unknown Animal Spirit Oracle by Kim Krantz. This is the sister oracle deck to the Wild Unknown Tarot deck. And the reason I am, I know this deck has been out for ages, I'm doing this video is because I have found it a really challenging deck to work with. I wanted to understand it kind of on a different level and begin working with it because I do love the artwork. And I understand there are many, many layers to this deck to explore. And so that's what we're going to do here today. There are five suits in this deck, earth, water, fire, and air, as well as a spirit suit. And that is indicated by this circle. There are 14 cards in each of these suits. Some of these piles look a little higher because I've got some uh, tarot cards in here as well, too. And there's seven cards in the spirit suit and four of them um, are out here on the table. Um, the reason why the phoenix is here, the phoenix is associated in this deck with the Muladhara chakra, with the root chakra. So with the element of the earth, the sea serpent is associated with the Swadhisthana chakra, the element of water, so the sacral chakra. For the Manipura, the fire chakra, we have the dragon. And then for the element of air, we have, and the heart chakra, we have the golden egg. And this might be an association that's not familiar for a lot of people. With the element of air, we tend to think of the suit of swords as opposed to the heart chakra. But when we're looking at the elements in relation to the chakras, we're looking at the heart chakra. The throat chakra is the element of ether itself. So this element here, um, the element of ether is associated with the throat chakra. And we'll get to that in a little bit. The other thing I want to point out is that each of these suits, there is a hierarchy of the 14 cards. And here we're looking at the first card of each of the suits. So bear for earth, crocodile for water, fire ant for fire, and moth for um, air. These are creatures of the forest and the field. These are creatures of the sea, lakes, rivers, things like that. These are creatures of the grasslands. Just let me see what her description is here. Grasslands and desert. And then these are creatures of the air. And some of these creatures you will have seen associated with different elements. And so this is quite a unique, unique deck in that respect. The hierarchy is not clearly defined, but we do need to take in cons into consideration how the animals move, how they behave, about their own spiritual evolution, of course, as well as where they are on the food chain and how different predators, how they are with different predators. The crocodile um, really doesn't have any predators, but why would the crocodile be lowest in the, in the water cards? And if I just go through here, you can see, you can imagine it would be dolphin and whale at the top, right? More intelligent species. So that kind of makes sense. And then for the element of earth, sorry, we have the bear as the first card and then um, a little more developed toward the end of the suit, we have the horse. And we will talk about um, kind of the evolution of each of the suits when we look at them individually. And then for the element of fire, we're starting with ant, and we make our way up to elephant and lion, lion and elephant at the end. And then for air, um, I believe it's eagle that's at the top, right? So eagle's at the top of the air suit. So that kind of makes sense, right? But the whole kind of sequence in between can get confusing, but it's really been uh, enlightening for me to associate numbers with each of these suits. 
And I think it would have been really useful if Kim had put just a little diacritic on each here. So bear is, or maybe even up here, bear is earth one. And um, like cheetah is uh, fire nine and hummingbird is air six. Just that would be kind of helpful in understanding the multiple layers of this um, deck. Surprisingly, Phoenix is here with the Earth suit, and the reason for that she explains in the guidebook. And if you haven't um, kind of integrated the information in the guidebook, I would really encourage you to go back and reread it if you have this deck. The Phoenix moves between these three suits. So as the Phoenix rises from the ashes, the energy is move, moves up towards the um, Manipura chakra and then back down again as the Phoenix um, goes back into the ashes. But this, um, this whole layer of these cards being associated with these cards, is, it's an important part of the deck to grasp. All right, so let's have a look at the suit of Earth. And there's just a few things that I want to point out in working with this deck. One, it's really important to look at the colors other than the color of the animal and to question why is there the, the light here. And the this is kind of like a fool card for me, the bear. The bear is waking from slumber as the bear comes out of hibernation. There is a stepping forth into an unknown. So hence the the light and the um, I'm gonna say almost hopefulness with this card then we go to the earthworm and you would wonder why does the earthworm have this kind of rainbow color inside um, inside its body right the earthworm as you know as we can see the, the natural repair here if you cut an earthworm it grows um, it continues to repair its body it has a very uh, strong restorative quality to this animal. So look to the colors, look to um, any other associations that appear on the card, like if there are suns or moons and things like that. The mouse is in the dark. The mouse, mouse is often has to hide as part of its natural uh, protective way to protect itself. So have a look at the light and the dark in each of the cards. Why is the rabbit all red here? Well, for me, this has to do with the sympathetic nervous, nervous system. The rabbit is always on high alert, wondering which bird is going to come out of the sky and snatch it away. So that, you know, red fiery energy is really important to understanding the, the energy of that card. The raccoon is in darkness and there's not a lot of the animal actual showing here. So why? You know, why is the animal not revealing itself? So as this comes up in a reading, these are the kind of questions that I would ask um, myself as a reader um, or ask about, you know, the querent and the surrounding cards. Now, the fox for me has taken on quite a whole new um, perspective since I have the Kitsune um, Oracle, the one by Lucy Cavendish, because that deck really speaks to the magic of the fox and the, the magical energy of the fox, as opposed to the sneaky, clever um, image that we tend to have of the fox. So I may read this card a little differently than most people, but again, look to the yellow. What does yellow represent? Here we have an earth element but with yellow color so you know draw these kind of things in why is the head featured not the whole body <laughs> um, I recently have been going through to prepare for another um, from Ariel um, tarot video and just revisiting the symbology of the Oreo Boris and as you know, in Kim's decks, she has um, this card as well as the Sea Serpent card, which is the spirit card for the, um, the water chakra. And then this is, the, this is the image for the world card in the Wild Unknown Tarot deck. And so I really encourage you to go back to, if you have the Mariel Tarot, and really look try to understand the depth of this symbology. Um, just the intricate sacred geometry that is here, 
you know, is an indication that this is a really important card. And the snake has so many different um, places in mythology and uh, yoga teachings. And so really pay attention. The more complicated the card, the more complicated the creature. Um, the, the, uh, the more time you should take to get to know the card. This buffalo card, um, if you have my favorite buffalo card um, of a recently acquired, not recently, I guess I got it a couple years ago, when it first came out, sorry, Colette Baron reads um, Mystical Shaman Oracle. I love the buffalo in that deck. And this has a very similar energy. So there's a strong connection to spirit here, a strong connection to the Sahasra, Sahasra chakra, so the crowned chakra, and the the um, you know you this ener this animal is so heavy and deeply connected to the earth, but at the same time deeply connected to spirit. And to me, that's what these pinky purple colors mean. The uh, for the seventh chakra. And then we have the lamb, and I pulled out the lamb card from the Wild Unknown Tarot, which is the Four of Swords. And these cards have a very, very similar nature. And you can see by, in the third eye here, the sun and the amount of energy that is in the third eye, kind of the spiritual evolution of this animal. And you have a very similar coloring here. You know, we have all these rainbow colors around the lamb. And so that is, you know, that's where your attention needs to go when you're looking, looking at these cards. Here is the elk. And in three of the four of these suits, Kim has made mention of uh, strong fe male and female energy. So this is definitely the father of this suit. So the father of, of earth is the elk. Um, and interestingly, in her tarot deck, she has chosen the same animal. So the father of pentacles is the elk as well too. And you can see the, the rainbow... Uh, the rainbow antlers indicating the connection to spirit. So there definitely is an association with these antennas, <laughs> if you will, connecting to spirit. One of my questions that is we're going to have a look at is there are a lot of solar eclipses in uh, her both of her decks. And so I want to look at all of the cards that have solar eclipses, which are basically similar to new moon energy. And why? Why do we have so many solar eclipses on particular cards and masculine cards at, at that as well, too? Um, so, yeah. And then we have... Uh, sorry. And then we have deer. So this is the mother energy of this suit. And she has the mother of pentacles is also a deer. A very soft, gentle coloring on both of these decks. And then I believe we have three animals left. So we have wolf, the spider, kind of surprising to be the second to last card in the uh, earth suit. But... You know, we need to really look at the symbology here, not just the animal, and look at all that the metaphor of the web, all that that means, and um, what that brings into the uh, into the reading. And you could actually look, you know, at certain colors. So maybe you want to look at these green colors, and if you have a connecting card here, what does that green color? What does that green card connect to? These are um, reds and pinks up here. So, you know, what card, what correspondence is up here? And and how, and where does this card appear in the reading? What is this, you know, what is its connection to? And then we have horse with this beautiful um, waning crescent, fiery waning crescent on the forehead. The other thing I want to bring to your attention to also is that Kim has a, uh, in each suit, an illuminary and a master. 
So the horse is the master of the earth suit and the spider is the illuminary of the, uh, of the earth suit. So that's another layer that you can build in to, um, to each of the suits. And then we go to the suit of water. So there is your spirit card for the suit of water, the sea serpent. And we start with the crocodile. And the stingray. This is a really interesting card. In a card that is so, um, I'm going to say low down the totem pole, we have some pretty potent uh, imagery here of the chakras being lit up. So this is a card that is going to want you to ask about, um, you know, what does the spine represent? What do the vertebra represent and how is that showing up in the reading? And maybe there's some attention that needs to be made here to the, you know, not being spineless. And um, where is... Where are you at with learning to stand up for yourself and also bringing in a layer of spiritual awareness too because that's a pretty, um, those are pretty loud and clear symbols there. This one for me is really interesting. So we have the fish flailing about here um, in the darkness and then we have the moon here which is colored red. And I believe in the guidebook, Kim talks about the fish kind of thrashing about, not going in any particular direction. And so the idea with the moon is a, is a cooling energy to cool down the hot directionless fish and to bring the, the energy in more um, uh, internal as opposed to, to external. So this is um, you know, a balancing energy uh, for the fish. And of course, you know, the lunar energy is a natural um, part of the water element. So it would be, what I want to say, it would be easy for the fish. So in a reading, all you would have to do is bring the attention to this feature. If this fish, if the fish came up in a reading, all you would have to do to the querent is to just bring up that very simple um, metaphor and that may bring great help and great um, ease and direction to the reading if that makes sense. And then we have starfish which is um, one of the most you know of course this is very um, uh, beautiful sacred geometry on the starfish itself so it's got this really simple background. So you want to look to that much like the spider and the, you know, what does this, um, what does this detail represent? You could also look to the, like we did with the spider web, look to which, where each of these is pointing. Um, perhaps this is pointing to something really important. The octopus has come up for me as uh, an animal that I want to do a little more reading about because of the Ostara taro. And there's a couple of octopus, or at least, yeah, I think there's two octopus in that taro. You also want to note here about how why the crown chakra is lit up for the octopus which is quite a di dichotomy, the flailing around, right? The, I believe one of the key words is lack of boundaries for the octopus. Perceptive, but lack of boundaries. So this is going to be quite a, a difficult um, card to read. Yeah, and then we have the sunlight um, reflected for the beaver. Make sure that, you know, you when you're looking at animals that are as equally... Um, versatile on the land as they are on the in the water because this is a, of course a water suit you want to bring that into the reading as well too because I think there's a few animals in this suit that uh, live on the land as well as the water oyster now that's a pretty cool card to bring into an animal deck and here we are really kind of looking to the metaphor of the pearl 
the turtle. Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. And here's a frog. So this is another example of a creature that lives um, equally well, equally adaptable on the land as they are in the water. And I just want to get to the, um, the illuminary and the master of this suit. This is the one suit where she did not really identify a strong masculine energy and a strong uh, female energy, but she really did identify the otter as the most playful creature in the whole deck. And that kind of harkens to another deck written by a yogi. Oh, the name eludes me right now. Land Sky Oracle and oh, the White Sage Tarot. And um, I, if you have that one, have a look at the otter energy in that deck. It's pretty pretty special. And then we have the shark with the blood on the teeth. And the swan energy, if there is a strong female energy in this suit, it goes to the swan. She does. She refers to um, the energy of Saraswati, the goddess Saraswati, in the Hindu pantheon of, of goddesses. So there's a strong element of spirituality with the swan. And you can also, of course, speak to the reflection, um, the as above, so below, and, and, and all that as well, too, because this is a really um, deep card as far as, as far as reading goes. And then we have dolphin and whale, which I believe I, we picked up earlier, and lots of brilliant, brilliant colors. So, so you want to address the um, the pinks and the purples, which again refer to the uh, seventh chakra. Okay, and then let's go to the suit of fire. So we have the dragon is the spirit animal for the fire suit. So we start with fire ant. Lots of chaos. <laughs> Organized chaos, let's say that. And then we have hyena, which I think is a really um, misunderstood creature. One of the things Kim looks or mentions in the guidebook is you know those kind of people who are always making fun of themselves a little too much sarcasm all the time and so I believe that's one of the strongest messages here and so that is about um, we can look to the moon here right and the the willingness the courageousness to kind of look at the shadow and to look at the shadow self and then we have scorpion which if you have um, astrology background, of course, you can relate to um, Scorpio. Lizard. And you've kind of got a, a lot of different colors here. So we have there's a lot of different directions you could, um, you could go with reading the Lizard card. So these cards, I strongly recommend you use them with a tarot deck because there are so many layers that you can pull out. And if you just read these cards by themselves, I think they're not used at their full potential. There's quite a few wildcats in this suit and the panther is the one that's down um, lower in the suit. And for me, that is feels more like um, a night energy, you know, a very um, impulsive kind of energy with the panther. Love those eyes. And then we have tarantula. And look at all of the fire around the tarantula. So you really want to address just the strength of this fire energy and kind of the imbalance of this fire energy as that comes up in a reading, as opposed to the camel, which is very much in balance. So the camel, which is um, a, a creature of the desert, is completely, this is very much like a temperance card to me. And we have that clue here um, with the blue, cool moon. Hmm. I love this card. Yeah, and this is very much a number 14 temperance card. And then we have the gazelle, a more graceful creature. And then, you know, you can look to this pattern here. So this pattern is a small circle here, but fully encompassed behind the cheetah. So that kind of shows you the, you know, the speed and the intensity and the, um, the energy of the card. 
So that's the second wild cat. And this, the reason I've got the father of wands here is because uh, in the guidebook she refers to the cheetah being the masculine, uh, strong masculine energy in this suit. So this would be the father of fire in this deck. And she chose the cobra in the, um, in the tarot deck. So just some food for thought. And then we go to Tiger. And again, another creature that has the uh, waning moon on the third eye chakra. So, yeah, sorry, not the, yeah, the, the, on the third eye chakra, on the Agnya chakra. So we have a fire animal. So an animal of the grasslands. But we have moon symbology here. So we have a really balanced energy here. And I wanted to bring this up because this is the animal that she chose for the high priestess in the tarot deck. And so for you to really understand this creature, why do we have the moon symbology with a really fiery animal other than, you know, the tiger hunts at night, but just to really understand the, um, the strength and the, the balance of this creature and how balanced this is not unlike the camel. Um, yeah. And the mother of wands. So this is the mother energy um, in this deck. So this would be the mother of fire. <clears throat> and again, in the tarot deck, she has the, um, the snakes as the animal for the uh, quartz in the suit of wands. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And then we have cobra. Look at the fire. And, you know, this is a lot of red as opposed to um, the yellows and oranges. So I would definitely speak to fear with this card if I was including this in a reading. The zebra has the fire element in the third eye chakra with all of these beautiful rainbow colors. Okay, so from the guidebook, eccentric, creative, and visionary. Zebras are the most precious of gems. They are young at heart, well-cultured, and have an undying curiosity about life. A little further on, she says that they have a potent, their potent magic is contagious. So I'm assuming that's why the, um, the rainbow colors in the, in the third eye chakra. And then we go to the lion which is the master of this suit. And the illuminary of the suit is the elephant, the last card. But I pulled the strength card from the tarot deck just to kind of show you the two lion drawings from the same artist. And yeah, so master of fire and shown in the strength card here. And so we have the kind of delicate soft the softness the balance shown with both the rose and the uh, lemon skate yeah. and then we have the elephant for the uh, illuminary of this suit and we can go to all kinds of associations with the elephant including of course the uh, Ganesh associations Okay, so that is the suit of fire. And then the final elemental suit is the suit of air, which starts with the moth, which is really kind of interesting. And we have the golden egg. So the golden egg is a beautiful um, card to meditate with. If you don't have a meditation practice, um, in just in itself, looking to the space of the heart and the flame within the heart is a, it's a really uh, potent thing to, um, to sit with. So we start with the moth. And again, this makes perfect sense, very low on the, on the food chain and very kind of a fragile, fragile animal. 
And then we got a butterfly and it kind of surprised me the butterfly was so far down in the air suit, mostly because the butterfly gets um, a very high kind of ranking in a lot of tarot decks, right? It often appears on um, the death card or the judgment card as far as, you know, transformation. And yeah, so that's the number two card for the air. And then we go to bat which really is no surprise um, that we have a moon here. So we're looking to the darkness and the, you know, the strength of being in the darkness and the strength of understanding your own darkness. And then we have firefly. So another creature of the night. And that's an important element to really to bring into this deck is to look at creatures of the night versus, versus creatures of the day. And here's a, a really, you know, good contrast right, of a, a creature of the day versus a creature of the night. And then we have Hummingbird. And I'm quite surprised that this one is illustrated with this all this black around it, because when I think of the Hummingbird, I mean, if I had drawn this deck, I mean, I can't draw, but if I had drawn this card, this would all be so super colorful. I just associate the hummingbird with love and joy and relationship and the appreciation of spontaneity and that kind of thing. So surprising. I'm surprised there's so much black on this card. And then we go to vulture, which of course is a super important animal, not only um, on the food chain, but for the health and safety of the grasslands. And this is a card of the air, but has a lot of associations with the grasslands. So with the um, with the fire, with the fire element, because the vulture keeps the grassland, the health, the health and wellness of of the um, you know by do, by taking the meat off the carcasses of the animals. So there's not a lot of rot. Of course, the sun does that as well too. But really important. And then we go to the crow. And I'm going to pull a few different crow cards for you and we'll talk about that aspects with the magician and, and so forth. But look at all of that energy underneath the foot of the crow. So the crow is kind of harnessing um, and, and standing on all of that, that energy. And then we go to the owl which is included in many, many decks, many, many tarot decks as well, too. And so we're getting quite high up in the suit of air. And the owl is number nine. And then we go to drag and fly. And this is a card that has me completely perplexed. If you have an idea why we have the element of water underneath the dragonfly. I know dragonflies do tend to, um, I mean, many times I've been on my paddleboard and I've sat down to rest and there has been a dragonfly land on my big toe, you know, things like that. I understand that, but I want to understand at a deeper level why we have the element of water in blue underneath the dragonfly. So we need to look at blue for throat chakra could be one because we are with the element of air which i said is heart but blue represents throat so you know these are the different kind of places my mind goes with that but i don't understand why the water symbol so we're going to second chakra so what is the second chakra association of the dragonfly and then we have a nightingale so lots of creatures of the night in this suit. And then Peacock, which I believe is the Illuminary or the master of this suit, the Illuminary. And of course, there's lots of references to um, gods and goddesses from the Hindu pantheon, the yogic teaching. So here we go to Krishna and Vishnu. And this is a very, very um, deep lots of profound stories like I'm going to the Bhagavad Gita for example and this is definitely an animal worth exploring the layers of of meaning behind um, the peacock and the peahen and note that this one is masculine right so peacock and then we have hawk and the last one is eagle and the eagle is the master and the masculine energy of the suit. 
and we have no kind of motherly energy identified in this suit. Yeah, so that's the element of, of, of air. And then the, the other three cards that I haven't shown you. So as I said, we're going, when we're going through the chakras, so we have the phoenix that kind of goes from, moves from the first to the third chakra. And then we had the sea serpent for water and the dragon for the fire. And for the um, heart chakra, we had the golden egg. And then now we move to the throat chakra, which is the uh, black egg. So this is all about um, learning to reveal one's truth, learning to speak one's truth. And then we go to the unicorn, which is no surprise. So who has the horn right coming right out of the frontal spot of the third eye chakra. So kind of a very high level of evolution. And I love all these soft rainbow colors on the moon behind the unicorn. And then we have the cosmic egg, which is representing the crown chakra and the highest evolution of all of the creatures in the deck. So that's a quick overview of, of all of the cards. And then I thought we would look at some of the symbols. I know I already mentioned the spider card, but when one of the things that came up for me when I put these two cards side by side was this is day, this is night. This spider is working day and night. This is a, a tireless kind of energy. So that's another kind of layer to bring into into a reading you know if you're working with um both of these decks or you just you know you have that um we did talk a little bit about color so color is super important and we have all of these fiery cards some are more yellow some are more orange some are more red and this really gives you an opportunity to address the color, not just about sun, but about um, perhaps, you know, an imbalance of the energy. Maybe there's too much of the energy or what are the cautions that need to come with too much red, too much yellow? Is it imbalanced? Like we have this card here, which has the feathers and all of this fire and then we have the pentacles right so this card shows a great deal of balance and harmony as opposed to where was that rabbit I know I already talked about the rabbit which is just all red you know kind of addressing um, the element of fear as opposed to fire and this one here which I didn't really I can kind of answer myself now brings in an energy of softness as well too right the feminine element so perhaps that's what is indicated by the water and we look at the deer card here we're looking at nice you know soft colors gentle colors uh, harmonious colors as opposed to the the fiery energy of the red so we have masculine we have feminine we have um you know, more gentle and more active colors. Some are more in balance than others. There are a whole slew of cards in these two decks that have a lot of rainbow colors. And some of them are quite dispersed and some of them are focused on a certain area. So if the rainbow color is here, that's where the focus needs to go. Right here's the rainbow. Here, that's where it's. That's where the energy, the focus on the reading needs to go, as opposed to the dolphin card, which has this beautiful rainbow color throughout. We talked about the earthworm already. Yeah. So really looking at the energy of the color, I think, is very important. Here's another example of lightning so we have the hierophant card from the wild unknown tarot and the lightning to me looks like it's striking the key so here we have a message from spirit which you know is delivering the message the key and the crow is on the hierophant card which is not surprising the crow tends to appear i think on the magician card or the hierophant card of the two kind of logical 
popular places for the crow to appear. But I wanted to show you a couple other um, crow cards. Here we have, this is the Messenger Oracle, and it's called the Keeper of Magic, which is pretty beautiful. And in the Crow Tarot, she's on the High Priestess. Well, she's on every card in the Crow Tarot, but I really like this particular um, High Priestess card. I think there's a lot of, of great, great symbology here. And perhaps I will do another video and um, address some of these other decks because I have a lot to share. All right, and then let's have a, one more quick look at the moons and we'll call this a wrap. And I think I got some of my wane, uh, waxing and waning crescents mixed up. And so let's just have a look at that because I think that's important. And I know sometimes artists um, do mix up the waning and waxing crescent, but there's definitely a different kind of energy with waning and waxing crescent, and that for sure can be brought into a reading. So we have the waxing crescent on the horse and the camel. So here's the camel and here's the horse. Okay. So waxing crescents here. So this is about the development of a new idea, a new opportunity, a new beginning, as opposed to the waning crescent on all of these cards here. So we have the four of cups, the empress, the moon, um, on the tiger, the fish, right? The nine of, I would say the nine of branches, the nine of wands, and also on the Nine of Cups. And I have another card here too. Oh, this is from the um, from the Naked Heart. So we have a waxing and a waning crescent on this one. So that doesn't really fit the, fit the theory. But so these cards are about coming into stillness, coming into contemplation, coming into the end of a cycle. So here we have a nine. Here we have a nine, the end of the cycle with the waning crescent. And on the Empress, why do we have a waning crescent as opposed to a waxing crescent, right? This kind of shows the maturity, the, you know, the fullness of the, the fullness of the cycle. And on the moon card here, again, we have a waning crescent. So we are in the darkness, moving toward the, the full moon cycle. So really looking to the looking to the shadow, looking into the depths of our soul, looking to the subconscious. And the last symbol that I wanted to look at today was the butterfly. So do you remember I said the butterfly was the second card in the suit of air in this deck? And that was surprising to me because the butterfly is often given a lot of weight in tarot decks. So here we have the butterfly in the Ace of Swords in the Naked Heart Tarot. Now this is the second edition. I, I believe this card has changed in the third edition. And then she also has it on judgment, which was something that I spoke to already. In the Wild Unknown, the butterfly appears on in several cards. So it appears in the Two of Pentacles. It appears in the Six of Wands, as well as the Eight of Swords. In different stages of the butterfly, different kinds of butterflies. But we need to look at kind of the energy and the message you know, of, you know, of the transformation energy. So here we are in a much earlier stage of the butterfly. And, um, you know, one of the things about this card is that this is a natural situation to find yourself in. Sometimes we do need to cocoon in order to blossom. And, there is no need to be, a, um, it's not unlike the Four of Swords, right? This is a, a natural time to turn inward so that we can uh, regroup and grow and evolve and turn outward. So this makes perfect sense to me here to have a butterfly. This reminds me very much of the Sasurai Bito, eight, uh, Sasurai Bito Judgment Card. And I totally understand that metaphor there. And here we have the butterfly emerging, right? Victorious in the Six of Wands. So yeah, so I, I find that, 
looking to the symbols as opposed to um, the animal itself or the keyword, if there's a keyword on the card, can be more potent and just really help with developing a reading. So I hope this has been of some help to you today. It feels like it was a little bit chaotic, but uh, it's been an important process for me and I have way too many cards out on my table. Um, and I will probably do something similar with the Naked Heart Tarot and some of the other animal decks that I haven't gotten to today. So thank you very much for watching. Stay well, my friends. Namaste.